In uh, the fall semester of um, the millennial year 2000, a student came into my office and wanted to switch her major to comparative literature. This is no great event, usually, but this particular uh, was coming to us from the School of Management. So I questioned her economic sanity in wanting to make such a move, figuring that uh, we were only enriching the future of the restaurant business by this particular change. But she insisted, and she became, uh, in, in a short time, a kind of a star in the undergraduate program. Her name is Brianne Goodspeed. I don't think she's here today, but she was here yesterday. And uh, I, I figured, as I was working with her, that uh, there was something else going on there besides a mere change of academic course, that something had affected her that got her out of uh, accounting or whatever she was in and, and brought her towards literature and the humanities. And it turns out that what that was was that she was working in Lynn Margulis' lab. So um, for a long period of time, Brienne kept saying, you must meet Lynn, you really must, you just have to meet her. And uh, I, I said, okay, yes, yeah, sometime. Um, and uh, I kept thinking, why would you want to meet me? I mean, after all, that's the north end of campus. We're the south end of campus. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not only am I in comparative literature, but I'm the very worst kind of comparatist, the one that gives uh, the discipline a bad name. I'm a dilettante. I describe myself as having a mind of velvet in a world of lint. Um, <laughs> And so Brienne kept at us for a long time, just kept going and kept going and kept going. And finally, uh, around uh, New Year's 2004, I had become editor of the Massachusetts Review a couple of years earlier. And I decided that uh, in order to raise the visibility of the magazine, it would be nice to give it a radio show. So we concocted a show called MR Squared, which went on to have a six-year run on WMUA. And the reason we put it on WMUA, which is the uh, university's community and student radio station, is there we could get unbridled freedom. Uh, you simply turn on uh, the microphone and start going. All you have to do is give the call letters at the top of the hour. The rest of it is just completely wide open. And that's the way we wanted it. So the show turned into a kind of orgy of free expression. Um, and uh, I finally decided, okay, Brienne, I'll invite uh, Lynn to come on the program. So uh, uh, Brienne sat in the corner grinning like a Cheshire cat while uh, Lynn and I had our first meeting. We met on the radio, quite literally. And uh, it was a really good conversation. It, it, unfortunately, the recording that was made uh, has vanished. Nobody can seem to find it. But uh, we immediately decided, oh, let's just do it again. So we did it again about three months later. And she became a kind of a regular on the program, a, a repeated visitor, probably was on six or seven times. And uh, we soon discovered, my co-host Roger Figa and I discovered that you could ask her anything. You could talk about anything with her. And uh, sometimes she did want to defend uh, the sciences because, you know, being from the south end of campus, I mean, what the sciences look like to us down there is R&D for the Pentagon and Big Pharma. And, and, and also a huge sucking force that sucks our budget away. So, we, you know, we, our opinion of the science is not necessarily favorable. So Lynn had made it one of the projects to, uh, to educate us a little bit about what the sciences were really about. Here's a, uh, I could pretty much have chosen any five minutes from any of the shows we did with her. This one was a program from uh, uh, 2007 on the occasion of the, uh, the publication of Luminous Fish. That was, uh, your mission was a sort of sing, uh, single person war on the two cultures phenomenon that was described by C.P. Snow about a century ago. Well, I think the real problem is that scientists are not talking to each other either mm. that uh yeah they tend to understand their little teeny specialty and the more you know they tend to know more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing whereas philosophers tend to know less and less about more and more until they know nothing about everything and this tendency is is marked in all people but it's remarkable uh how little the knowledge diffuses and I'm really interested in a large number of topics in science because, to me, science is the only way of knowing. Well, maybe it's not. It's the best way of knowing. There's other ways of knowing, of course. But science is the way that you can know something better. You can't know it. There's no truth. <laughs> 
but you know it better and better because it's something that people can measure and observe the same thing and think about it and put it in context and come to the same conclusions regardless of the slant of their eyes or the color of their skin. It's something that we all can do, and in, in principle, everybody can do science. And in practice, a lot of people do. A lot of people come from very different backgrounds, and they do participate in science. So to me, science is the way of knowing. And it's so discouraging to me when the entire culture teaches and believes stuff for which there's very good evidence against. I mean, it's not that it's not mm. right. It's that it's wrong in every way and they have no way of evaluating as a culture we have no way of evaluating whether it's a good piece of information or if it's a ridiculous piece of information and and that's what i'm trying to do yeah and of course in the acceleration of information in the so-called information age here where there are so many ways to convey uh little digital particles of knowledge from one point to another and the, the uh, ability to differentiate between what's important or even interesting is really kind of vanished well i would never say interesting i take interesting out of all my students work when they say this is interesting i say to who to your mother i mean the things i find interesting nobody does but important in the sense <laughs> in the, important in the sense that <laughs> These people in these scientific activities are important because they make decisions and make measurements that have huge amount of influence that they can't even possibly predict that they're going to have influence. And what I'm trying to show is that the personal lives that seem like a personal decision, um, some guy's mistress is pregnant, he's got to get rid of it, he's developing pills, can turn out to be amplified and have huge effects on so many people. And, of course, mm. the dropping of the uh, atom bomb. We, we read here that Tibbetts, the guy who, uh, who flew the plane, his life was preserved in exchange for 100,000 Japanese. Mm. And, I mean, that's what, what's happening mm. here. And mm -hmm. it's this amplification effect of where the person... Well, th this gives you an idea how, how rapidly this moved from one from a topic as broad as, broad as that down to the uh, flight of the Enola Legay in just seconds. So uh, we covered uh, in this orgy of free expression, we covered an enormous amount of territory. And as her appearances became more and more frequent, Roger and I uh, became emboldened. We realized we could ask her absolutely anything. So we, we, uh, we decided, okay, well, let's ask her if the human race is going, is going to go extinct. So uh, we asked her that, and she goes, yes. We said, well, why is that? And she replied, symbology and genital friction. <laughs> Symbology being, of course, money uh, is what she meant by that. Money and overpopulation. So that was just a terrifically concise answer to the question of human extinction. Um, but then the, uh, the, the one that, that, uh, that had the sort of delayed action impact on me most of all was one where, uh, where Roger suddenly said, uh, do you know what happens after death, Lynn? She goes, yes. <laughs> he goes, well, what is it? She goes, you see that little spot of yeast at the corner of your mouth? It takes over everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember thinking, now that's good radio right there. That's uns unsentimental, blunt, and direct. And then on the way home in the car, it just hit me that I had completely missed the point. I was supposed to be looking at it from the point of view of the yeast, for whom this would be a very favorable outcome. <laughs> And once I understood that, I began to see that, that uh, Lynn's partisanship of, uh, of life, which was so beautifully illustrated in Richard's uh, uh, video, um, that partisanship of life meant that life was going to go on regardless of whether one species prospers or fails. And this, in this regard, uh, Lynn's thinking approached the spiritual. Uh, and I got from her not only a completely revised view of uh, what science is, real science is about as opposed to big science, which she hated, uh, but what real science was about, but also some a spiritual knowledge that I felt a lot in the last day and a half here, uh, that everybody sitting around together realized that uh, we are all in interconnected, that we really don't know each other, hardly any of us. And, and that's what spirituality is about. It's about interconnections. It's about seeing 
uh, past the boundaries of an individual moment or an individual or an individual species and seeing the great connectivity of it all. So it, in the end, I got a kind of a spiritual enlightenment from her. And I think that's something that hasn't been addressed explicitly in the last couple of days, but something that I think a lot of us feel. Um, I live within uh, earshot of Puffer's Pond. and. Uh, and that's, that has the sound of a waterfall has a sort of spiritual quality to it. You feel things expanding. But then, of course, you know, this was also the site of uh, Lynn's uh, swimming in the summer and of the last uh, great project on which she launched when she noticed something as mundane as a bump on a log and found some incredibly archaic uh, microorganisms in there. And, uh, and then, after Lynn died, uh, her ashes were strewn in the pond. So the end, I wrote a, a little bit of an essay. I'll just read the very end of it. But when you get to the pond at the end, you have to realize that the pond is carrying Lynn to my ears all the time. It's one thing to be a scientist. It's another to be a full-service intellectual. Lynn won her honors for science, but those of us who knew her realized that there should be other prizes for sheer mentality, for sh the willingness to consider any problem political, cultural, poetic, economic, metaphysical, medical, or whatever. She never took on a problem without problematizing it further. There was never an answer that stopped the investigation. No question was ever settled or dead. She was a process thinker in a field addicted to conclusions. For her, there were no conclusions. This was the trajectory of the mind as far as it could go, and it could always go farther. That's why her death is unacceptable. It looks on the outside as if the questions were answered, a ribbon tied around the book. It is not so. Lynn may have died, but when Lynn was about, will never, cannot die. It's up to the rest of us now to keep making problems, to keep a keen eye on the world, to see how everything is always changing, to let the mind open into wonderment. Her ashes were scattered in Puffer's Pond, where night after night the cataract falls down in an eternal cascade of questions. Thank you. I worked for 30 years in, in medical television, and uh, we worked with a full crew. And when I got to know Lynn, uh, I really learned what quick and dirty and run and gun meant. Uh, <laughs> I met Lynn, and I didn't know who she was. I'd been sent to fix her, uh, her editing system. And uh, my friend Ernie Irvater, who had spoken with her, said, uh, oh, Jim, just have Jim come over. He'll fix the thing in a few minutes. I'll take all day. And, and I did. I fixed it in a couple of minutes, because it was a very easy problem. As soon as practically I walked in, I could see what was wrong. And I had no idea who Lynn Margulis was, except that she was late for a class that she was teaching at UMass, uh, Lynn was always late for teaching, or <laughs> late for everything, pretty much. Um, I soon learned who she was. And um, as part of the work that I did with her, she had a few seconds of a few slides that dissolved between each other and that the CBC had done to show her work. And, I said, well, I could, you know, and they were problems with it. She didn't like the way it was animated. She said, uh, I'd really like to have this replaced, but this is the best I can, I can do. Um, so I said, well, I could, I could animate that for you. Um, so thus began my education in uh, eukaryotes. I didn't know what a eukaryote was, in spite of the fact that I had worked around medicine for 30 years. Um, and Lynn, uh, slowly enrolled me into being a student. Um, my first assignment, I was sitting in on her uh, Tuesday seminar was to, uh, she said, okay, well, Jim, you'll do something on uh, deep water corals. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to do anything on deep water corals. I don't know anything about them. I, they don't seem interesting. Uh, it was very, as soon as you got into looking into deep water corals, they were, they were fascinating. 
And this is something that I would say to people in the environmental evolution class. I would say, don't, don't worry too much about what you're going to talk about. Just pick something and investigate it. You'll find out. It's very interesting. Um, and I think this was true of uh, the science that you taught. My master's degree, uh, because mostly what I got very fascinated by was why Lynn's work wasn't more um, well known and more mainstream. Uh, so I've been sort of exploring why people resist ideas. It's amazing how entrenched ideas become. I think over the last nine years, uh, we became very good friends. I used to accompany her every morning. Uh, this first started out with sort of uh, Socratic dialogues where she would teach me about diploidy and uh, other things. Every morning I would have my lesson as we would run the dog, uh, Menina. We would go swimming. She would swim every morning in Puffer's Pond. Uh, Menina would not. <laughs> Menina would bark at the beavers. Um, Lynn said, uh, Jim, I really like you because just like me, you like to do what 10-year-old boys like to do. <laughs> is it, is it? It's video. Oh, great. I mean, is the, is the um, sound working? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Never again. Huracan <laughs> Irene. Look how high the water is. I mean, really be careful. This current. Oh, the current's terrible. Where's the tree? Is the tree gone? Well, trees. Well, I can't wait to see the picture of the though. I don't even see shadow blasts. I think they've all been wiped out. Oh, no, they're not all of them. Okay. Here, we, here we are out on the tree, and there's quite a current rolling through here because the pond is in flood. Yeah, we'll get out, sweetie. Tell me when I can drop it. Okay, you drop it. Okay, let's, let's see what else is on the I don't think I I don't think I've ever had as much fun in my whole life. Um, and like a lot of other people have said, I got to go to uh, uh, first to Woods Hole and then to uh, East Germany to uh, Mexico, to St. Petersburg in Russia, uh, ostensibly to videotape uh, Lynn, although often uh, it would be radio because Lynn would turn all the lights out. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to look at me, you want to look at the organisms. I think one of the real tributes to her cadre of students that she's turned out over the years is that uh, I think they all think their own thoughts. They're not simply people who parrot Lynn. I worked with Sean for a, a long, long time in the same little room, and uh, he's been working on microbialites. And uh, the end of this semester, he said, you know, these things might be abiotic, as much as Lynn would like to have had them be biotically mediated, that her students could think, you know, they might be abiotic. My last little story is just that I have uh, Massimino Pajoro from Italy staying with me. We went swimming once in the rain in Puffer's Pond. I think it was the first time Massimino had gone swimming with Lynn and I in the rain, and it was, it was sort of a joyous occasion. Uh, but he told me that uh, whenever he was living with Lynn, uh, he had to speak Italian uh, with Lynn. She would not uh, speak English. She would just speak Italian. And this eventually led to him going home speaking a very terrible mix of <laughs> Italian and Spanish. <laughs> so we will all miss her very much. <laughs>